Good evening, everyone. Uh, great to see you all here. Um, I just have a, a few quick uh, introductory comments. Uh, my name is Tom Fleischner. I'm the executive director of the Natural History Institute here. Great to see you all. Um, I know uh, we have a lot of familiar faces here, but also a lot of people have mentioned that this is their first visit. So I just want to mention that we are um, an independent nonprofit organization, our, um, and our, our mission is to foster a renaissance in interdisciplinary natural history that integrates art, science, and humanities. And uh, certainly the talk tonight and the show is uh, right, uh, right in the heart space of that, that mission. <coughs> so it's great to see you all here. If you haven't been here before and you'd like to keep in touch with us, there's a, a sign-up sheet for an email announcement list. We don't share that with anybody. So uh, and you can get off anytime, so please. Uh, join our community. Um, so, um, it's like I say, wonderful to see you all here for the, the opening of this fantastic show. It's my pleasure to introduce my, my longtime friend and colleague, Deborah <laughs> Ford, who I know many of you know. Um, and because you're all here at this opening, you already know, if you didn't before, that Deb's work is, is breathtakingly beautiful insightful and imaginative and um, really looking forward to hearing what she had to say as some of the contextual uh, background on this particular show. Um, Deb has been, um, well, among uh, has been an arts educator and administrator as well as a practicing artist for many, many years. Uh, we were colleagues at Prescott College for a long time where she, for many of those years, was the uh, chair of the Arts and Letters program. She, among many other things, was the executive director of the Playa Arts Residency Center. Oh, we're at, there's at least a couple of us in here who uh, benefited from that beautiful space um, and has been um, awarded awards in multiple states. So it's, it's just great to have Deb here tonight. Before I, uh, there's two little announcements I want to make. One is, um, with every exhibit we have here, we, we change the exhibits every about two and a half months. So with each show we have, in addition to the exhibit, we have an artist talk, which in this case is, of course, tonight. But we also have some kind of field experience workshop that is associated with it. And in this case, um, there's some flyers on the table out there. It's called Seeing the Unseen. Um, this will be a workshop. You need to register. Um, if you're interested in that, Pat Ziemer, our office manager who's been uh, at the door, can sign you up for it. There's a limited number of spaces. This is on January 4th, which is a Saturday. It'll involve both time here in our lab as well as in the field nearby. And, and uh, Deb will be joined in the leadership of that by Bob Ellis, our uh, program director, and by Morgan Ford. Uh, who is a riparian ecologist and also happens to be Deb's offspring. So that's going to be a really exciting um, uh, exciting day as well. Um, and finally, every time we have a speaker here, we offer them one of our hats <laughs> and their choice of color. So I wanted to present Deb with her, her hat. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> so, thank you. Welcome, Deb. Can I wear that now? <laughs> Um, whew, okay. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I'm not a real fan of public speaking, but I'm going to get over it here in a minute. Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to thank the Natural Hi History Institute for letting me uh, have this exhibit here and um, 
and particularly Tom Fleischner and Bob Ellis, because they really helped coordinate uh, so much, and to Pat Seamer as well. Um, but also to the selection committee, which I, my proposal was pretty out there because I didn't really, I was on sort of vacation, I was traveling when I submitted it and didn't have any work to really submit other than old stuff, and so I kind of made something up. <coughs> but that's the way it goes, you know. Um, uh, but they were, uh, they saw some merit in that ambiguous proposal and went for it, and particularly to Diane Gilbert also and Jen Chandler for helping me hang that beast in there, especially the one on the left, the periodic table. Um, and lastly, thanks to Jordan, who, uh, my son, uh, a perceptive artist in his own right, who I said, hey, Jordan, would you have, you know, do you think you could create something? And I sort of gave him some links to some microorganisms, I said, because you can't really see those in what I'm doing. And so he did, and we played around with some ideas, and, you know, he's um, very successful, and I think, in what he did, what he created. Um, <clears throat> because they're the real stars. The microorganisms are the real stars of this exhibit. Uh, and I don't know if you, any of you read that statement in there or not, but you're gonna get bits and pieces of it. Um, but first, my disclaimer, I am not a scientist. I'm not even a citizen scientist. Um, <clears throat> I'm a photographer. And when I was at, in the Arts and Letters program, I found it really difficult to write up something and hand it out to all the writing faculty because, of course, they would tell you what the typos were and that your grammar wasn't correct. And now I'm talking about some science that I don't really, that I really know very little about in front of all these scientists, including my son Jordan and Morgan, um, and Morgan as well. Um, so, all I can tell you is I'm a photographer, that I'm infatuated with some scientific phenomenon and from the natural world, uh, maybe even smitten um, by that. And, but my knowledge is just like one of these microorganisms of which 500 can you know, be in a grain of sand. Um, <clears throat> And so these first few slides, you know, the biophilia, hypoth biophilia hypothesis comes to the periodic table. I know, sometimes they just get caught up in things. Um, but E.O. Wilson is one of my favorite uh, people, and even though I, half of, more than half of what he writes about, I'm like, what does that really mean, you know? Um, <clears throat> but hopefully these first few images will give you some background into where, how this, project developed. Um, in 2003, I was in residence at Bio Royal, which is out in Lake Superior, and I learned that fungi and cyanobacteria come together and they create this new life form called lichens, which you see parts of here, and in this symbiotic process. And so I tried for a couple of years after that, finding out about that symbiotic process and lichens, I tried to do that with photography. So I took two photographic processes, uh, calotype, which is a silver process, and cyanotype, which is an iron process, and multiple negatives, and I tried to print them so they would create some kind of hybrid, like um, something that resembled a symbiotic process. And so calotype is a silver process, it's a brown image, and cyanotype is an iron process. And the two processes, they don't just come together. You can't just, you know, paint one over the other. And so I had to alter their formula, and um, I didn't really know. I haven't had chemistry since high school, you know. Um, <clears throat> and so the chemicals in one would adversely react with the chemicals in the other. But it was fun. Um, so cyanotype, which is this blue-green process, the photo process, um, and then with the cyanobacteria, which was, you know, with the lichens, and I thought, well, that's kind of curious that they sound alike. A curious and funny connection for me. Um, but cyanobacteria would keep coming back into uh, my work. Um, <clears throat> for eight years, I photographed in and around the Powder River Basin, 
Montana and Wyoming, where oil and gas exploration was expanding exponentially, and the toll on the landscape was awful. The habitats were destroyed, and it was just devastating, and I became some, you know, deeply worried about our environment. And so after that, I began, I, but I kept photographing it, um, I began looking for more hopeful ways to move forward. Um, I don't consider myself a landscape photographer, just a photographer that works within the landscape. It was funny, my son I haven't really seen landscapes like this before. And it's like, yeah, not a landscape photographer. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I began looking at alternative landscapes, at, such what is found at Biosphere 2 down in Oracle, Arizona. Um, and I spent time at B2 uh, over the next couple of years. And my time there allowed me to go from you know, concern and anger and despair. And my own visual research led me to scrape the surface of understanding the interconnectedness and the complexity of life's biological processes. Um, and so this, A Nearly Fatal Illusion, was the last exhibit that I think I had in Prescott at Sam Hill. And it was a three-part exhibit about science and art and natural reclamation of a, a battery at Fort Warden and, um, and especially John, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Two of those images are in this show that I brought because one thing leads to another in natural evolution for me. But, and their roles in these biological processes of photosynthesis and decomposition and oxidation, et cetera. Um, I retired in, can these go down a little bit or they can't? Or can you see that okay? I don't know how, like to me I get a little glare so I can't quite tell. Oh, okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> In 2017, I retired from being a executive director of apply a residency program of arts and science. So, you know, I've been trying to develop this connection and nurture it along for quite a while and moved to Montana full time. And uh, during this time, I've been photographing. I don't live too far from Yellowstone. And so um, I continue to be fascinated with the role of water. You know, obviously, you can see that this whole thing is covered with water, and especially the geysers and the fumaroles and the hot springs and the mud pots and other pretty extreme parts of the environment that are there. Can you all hear me okay? Um, just like raise your hand if I'm mumbling, because I might do that. So this is Grand Prismatic Spring, which is the largest hot spring in the United States. It's 145 degrees to 188 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's nice and warm. Um, and directly behind where that photograph was taken is this, which is Excelsior Geyser, which used to be the, the large, one of the largest geysers in the world until 1890, and then it stopped erupting. Um, and, but things you know, like Steamboat Geyser, which is erupting there now, left and right, hadn't erupted for years and years and years. And so it's you know, pretty exciting. And so this vivid blue here is one, one of the hottest parts of Yellowstone. It's about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a public domo domain photograph. I did not take this. I would have, but they don't let you have drones or anything like that. And I don't have a drone anyway, but um, uh, <clears throat> it's an aerial photograph of Grand Prismatic Spring. You know, so we were standing there on, see that walkway as it comes down? And we were looking in from there. Um, and Excelsior Geyser is just out of the photo. Um, and so the walkway around that corner of the walkway is where I took those last couple of images. And what I find about this is awe-inspiring. And there are very few things that I think are awe-inspiring to me. And, when, and usually they uh, revolve around something in the natural world. So I didn't understand why, where these colors come from. And so I started researching it, and I found out they're caused by minerals and microorganisms, living things. 
microbes, which may be the oldest form of life on Earth. Um, and they're everywhere. And today on, on 1A or whatever, I heard them talking about all the microbes in our mouths <laughs> and in our mucus. Um, and so the number of microorganisms out in the world is staggering. I mean, they make up the majority of species, including bacteria, archaea, viruses, etc., cetera, um, and some eukaryotes. Uh, so how do, how do we recognize the difference between microorganisms and minerals? And I don't mean for this to be a science class. And I'll, you know, I'm just going to fill you in. Minerals usually precipitate around the outside edges of things, of pools. Or when the waters dry up, then you're usually left with the minerals like that. Microorganisms usually grow out from the runoff, you know, so from the source channels. And thermophiles, which are heat-loving microorganisms and, and cold-loving. Uh, and extremophiles, I mean, I even like their vocabulary, you know, the extreme heat, freezing, and or acid-loving are extremophiles, and they live in the bottoms of the oceans, and they live in ice, and they, you know, and they exist in these harsh environments. And many, many such as on the right, forgive my pronunciation of these things, Metallosphera and orange archaea seen here living at 122 to 176 degrees. Um, uses iron for energy and becomes coated with rust. And cyanidium is an algae and it can withstand temperatures above the boiling point. And these two are runoffs from two different geysers, Pinwheel and Whirligig. But um, microorganisms uh, usually look spongy, soft, or wavy. So all of those string like things. Organisms, and you can see it here. This is so hot. I, you know, every time I would put my camera over, it would just like steam up, and you know, my glasses would steam up. And um, minerals typically look crystalline or hard, like mammoth that you see here. So this tree of life that we have here is shows the breaks down these domains, and we're over here in eukaryotes. Um, so algae. Uh, fungi, but humans and plants, etc. And every so on the left you have all these bacteria and then, um, and I'm sorry. So most of the autoclaves, they were always set to 250 degrees. They thought that would kill everything. But you know, it's only sort of recently, in the you know, recent past, that they discovered these things living in extreme environments. Chlorobium, which is on the left here, found at Mammoth, thrives at, a, at 90 to 126 degrees Fahrenheit, and it carries out photosynthesis. Uh, without making oxygen, and, and it's a green sulfur bacterium, um, and it grows in long chains and creates dense mats, microbial mats, and produces sulfur. And some scientists think that it played um, a part in mass extinction events, because when oceans were lower in oxygen, chlorobium would have been a successful photosynthesizer. And so now this is the edge of what I know, you know. <clears throat> and produce large amounts of methane and hydrogen sulfide gas, which is what you smell a lot when you're in Yellowstone, increasing, which would increase global temperatures and acid rain. Acilla toria, which also is a sculpture in there, um, is a cyanobacteria that lives in 96 to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. And it usually tends to be orange, but not always, and produces energy through photosynthesis. And, you know, and also fixes nitrogen for plants. And all of these m microorganisms, a lot of them exist side by side, and they create these microbial mats that are just millimeters deep. Um, but the colors, depending on the amount of sunlight also that they receive, and they, and they change from in the seasons. And so these areas up there 
are always in flux and changing. And so when the water stops, you know, at the end of the summer, the microbial mats die, and only, say, the travertine remains, you know, created from the limestone below. <clears throat> and so while I was researching this, I found this place in Bozeman, Montana, called the Thermal Biology Institute. It's like, what? And they refer to these microbial colors as the living colors of Yellowstone. Because what happens, you see those boundaries? Well, usually at those boundaries, there's a temperature change or a pH change or something else. And so, you know, they, um, they're very distinct boundaries of color. And in some seasons, you see more than, you know. Um, so I purchased one of these, which is not a pointer, but an infrared thermometer. So when I would go there and photograph, I'd make a photograph and I'd write down where I was and you know the date and stuff. And then I would check what's the temperature over here and what's the temperature over here and you know. Um, not that it told me anything, but it was kind of fun, you know. <laughs> you know, and I did find that, oh, you know, it seems like the green and the brown are usually a little bit cooler than the others. That's as close as you know, my science went. <clears throat> and here's another example where you can see them running out and they just start to form these channels and separate out and precipitate. You can see the minerals precipitate out in these various places. And so one of the really cool things that I found out that in the 60s at Yellowstone, Dr. Thomas Brock, who's affiliate, um, who is affiliated with this now still, discovered a bacterium Thermus aquaticus. What another great name, huh? <clears throat> and it thrives at 104 to 174 degrees. And what, it, what they found was one of the enzymes that they extracted from it um, was something called TAC polymerase. polymerase. And it's heat resistant, but it acts like a copy machine for DNA. So all of the stuff happening with copying DNA, that all came from that. And one of the researchers, you know, wound up getting a, a Nobel Prize after that. You know, so in that DNA, in that, um, what it's called, polymerase chain reaction, you know. So now in work in labs all over the country um, for medical research, for crime investigation, and more. You know, that's all because of that. I mean, I just feel the importance of microorganisms cannot be overstated here, you know. They play a critical role in nutrient cycles, Bob, I could tell us about that, from photosynthesis to the fixation of nitrogen for food production and plant growth, um, and with carbon impacting the abundance of, uh, or altering climate and oxygen in the air and greenhouse gases. And that you can do this with your cell phone is just like, you know, that you can take this home with you. I mean, <clears throat> they've already, microbes have already made a huge impact in biotechnology. Obviously, viruses are microbes too, you know. Um, and so the, in agriculture, medical diagnosis, and may hold the answers for cures to diseases such as cancer. So yellows usually indicate the presence of sulfur, either that it's been metabolized, I mean, some produce it and some eat it. And the yellows in Yellowstone really range. And it's, I don't know if you quite get it on this. Um, and the browns here is something called Calithrix, which is a cyan cyanobacterium, but it, um, it acts as a sunscreen to other microbes. You know, because these layers, even though they're millimeters, only millimeters deep, it's pretty cool. You know, cyanobacteria are usually orange, but occasionally green. And so when you see this, you see these places where the microbial mats are kind of torn, and you can kind of see underneath it or into it. Otherwise, sometimes they look more uniform like this. And one of my favorites, and Jordan has it in there too, is Sulfolobus. Um, and this one is called Sulfolobus acidocaldarius. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's an acid loving archaea, thrives in 176 degrees Fahrenheit, and metabolizes sulfur. 
So here it is at work. So sulfalobus, here's steam from the volcano below, pre, you know, the long ago volcano below. Hydrogen sulfide gas is bubbling up through the rhyolite, the volcanic rock, um, becoming sulfuric acid, and it turns the rock into clay. I, I'm just like, who does this? <laughs> you know, and depending on the season, this is the same spot. So depending on the season, the organisms change color. The activity in the springs, you're going to get more runoff, so you're going to have all this spray happening. Um, and then at the end of the season, you know, it's more dry like that last one. But sulfalobus also call it, cause these, and the, and the colors are also created by other kinds of minerals and oxid, oxidation. Um, and this is Echinus geyser. It has these little spines, and it's the largest uh, acidic geyser known with a pH of three to four, and it gets its red color from iron oxides. Um, this is the photo in there, Formidium, which is an orange cyanobacteria. And, you know, it's found, and so it, it builds long streamers, but it also builds these stromatolites that you see on the right here, a layered sediment. Um, and scientists are exploring the use of form Formidium to shrink uh, tumors. Um, you can also see the abundance of Calithrix, the brown stuff back there, which is the sunscreen for the others. And this is kind of what it looks like more close up with the, both of them. Um, and so microorganisms, and just so by um, Excelsior geyser, but this is not it, this is still in Grand Prismatic. Um, but they think that, so microorganisms similar to these found in Grand Prismatic have been responsible for making the Earth's atmosphere oxygen oxygen rich and here just at Excelsior geyser not here but behind here I don't have the photo included here are some of the oldest fossilized microorganisms that exist three and a half billion years old <clears throat> and so E.O. Wilson um, he refers to living The, you know, these are, like I said, are just a few millimeters thick. And sometimes, you know, they have to actually put up signs to warn people not to stick things in there, um, you know, because it destroys them, you know, and then they have to rebuild them. So fumaroles, or steam vents, uh, are some of the hottest places, uh, the geothermal features in Yellowstone. Um, and they're, boy, I just, this is Porcelain Basin, and um, Porcelain Basin, it, the whole, you can't walk anywhere through it because it is just a, sort of a bubbling mass and it's just underneath the surface. It's so hot. And these opaline sort of um, milky deposits are called silica sinter because they're, they're, you know, they, the evaporation causes that built that precipitate and then they get in there and they just kind of everything has this sort of pastel look to it you know some of the some of, and, and silica is the primary component of glass um, hence my asking Jordan to help with this and some of the orange colors he, here come from iron and arsenic as well uh, and the thermophiles create it but this area is just so near the surface and boiling water and steam, and it, it's changing all the time. You know, there might be a geyser here or a fumarole here, but, and then tomorrow it's over here. Not tomorrow, but not that fast, but, you know, like that. You know. Um, and all of these features exist 
um, because Yellowstone in, is a uh, site of a super volcano that erupted only 630,000 years plus ago, um, which is relatively recent, but it's huge. The, almost the whole park is in the caldera. And the heat from the volcano still fuels the activity, um, heating water from the runoff and gases that make their way up under pressure. Um, and this unique environment, uh, I, I think, really probably holds a lot of answers um, for about early life. I even watched a PBS special recently on, uh, on the planets, and that's kind of what they were talking about, even the similarity. Um, so habitat loss and other effects of climate change around the world are pretty well documented, I think, you know, that most of us believe that. But there's um, very little known about the effects on microorganisms and microbial life. And it, it's a huge part of the Earth. And so I think more research on microorganisms and their roles in early Earth, which that's what they're working on, will provide these huge answers to these huge questions that we have. Um, this is that area that was so hot. Just um, <clears throat> Huge questions about life, how it began. Astrobiology, which is the study of life in the universe, um, also focuses on these questions, how life began and evolved. Is there life elsewhere in the universe? And astrobiologists believe the life forms that we may discover on, other, on nearby moons or planets will be similar to those found here at Yellowstone in the similar environments um, and ge geothermal locations. So Roaring Mountain, which you can only get a snippet of here, uh, Sulfalobus acidocaldarius has changed this mountain. It's just moved it and built it and transformed it. Um, you know, it, it, it's sulfur eating, it's round, it's acid loving. And this changing shape of erosion on this mountain really is due to just those microorganisms. Uh, hydrogen gas is turned into the sulfuric acid and turns the rock again into clay. What does any of this have to do with um, biophilia hypothesis? As, well, as E.O. Wilson stated for me, to, well, not for me, he didn't say it for me, he stated for all of us, <clears throat> to explore and affiliate with life is a deep and complicated process in mental development and our existence depends on this propensity. Our spirit is woven from it. Hope rises on its currents. And the conclusion that I draw is optimistic to the degree that we come to understand other organisms, we will place a greater value on them and ourselves. He's so wise. Um, so, you know, people seek out wild and scenic places like Yellowstone for many reasons. Most come, you know, they want to see the grizzly bears. They want these encounters with wildlife, wolf, bison, and elk. You know, I, I hung out there for a lot in the last couple of years. Species that I couldn't really see with the unaided.
serve any purpose. <laughs> For me, it's really a way to direct your attention and something that's in the focus. appear to be three-dimensional and others aren't it's that's you know make these that's sulfalobus at work you know, can't see it just hint at it um, it's grand prismatic and this is sort of the last word from Yellowstone during for my presentation right here the past month in Escalante, Utah, looking at the desert floor, <laughs> you know, and so there's no water or very little water, but, you know, obviously there is water, but, um, you know. So thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions. Or <laughs> you want to take a temperature, you know. Any, be happy to answer any questions. I don't know anything scientific. <laughs> this. And so the, the grant that I received from Montana Arts Council had to do with sort of traveling this from, to somewhere else, too. And um, I don't know what I'm, I can't answer that. I wish I could. You know, but, but it's kind of a, a puzzle that I'm trying to figure out. And it was just, I had to make kind of a leap to create what I did. You know, so. Um, you guys need coffee? <laughs> um, anything else? I just. Thank you for coming on and spending time here. Thank Thanks, Ross. And there is a workshop on January 4th in 2020 with uh, Bob Ellis, biologist Morgan Ford there holding the infant, and myself. That will be evolving. <laughs> <laughs>